Hello and thank you for joining us as we talk about Ireland. I'm Jim Bruce and my guest today is a filmmaker and a writer. I'm delighted to welcome Bob Quinn to the programme. Bob Quinn has been making films professionally for almost 60 years. He began his career in Tel Aviv in 1961, working his way up through the ranks to become a programme producer. His unease at the growing commercialisation of Irish television led him to resign from the station in 1969. He set up his own production company, Cine Gale, and over the course of the following five decades, he has produced, directed or written numerous films for both television and the cinema. Among these are Potcheen, an Irish language feature film starring Cyril Cusack, Donald McCann and Neil Tobin and a TV documentary series, Atlantean, which challenged conventional theories about the origins of the Irish. In addition to making films, Bob Quinn is also the author of several works of fiction and non-fiction, including Maverick, A Dissident View of Broadcasting Today, published in 2001. In 2010, he donated his extensive archive of photographic images to NUI Galway. He was the first filmmaker to be elected a member of Aestana, Ireland's Association of Creative Artists. Bob Quinn was born and raised in Dublin and has lived in the Connemara Gaeltacht for most of his adult life. I am grateful to Bob Quinn for inviting me to his home, where our conversation took place on a beautiful spring morning. Maybe I'll start by asking you if you think Ireland has changed much over the course of your life. It certainly has. But then, again, uh, the only thing that's permanent in this life is change and entropy and the second law of thermodynamics and things like that. So uh, we're in a state of change all the time. Sometimes changes are perceptible. Mostly change is not perceptible. They're as perceptible as the leaves growing on trees. One day you look at them and there's no trees, and the next day you look, or a week later, and there are leaves on them. So that change has happened imperceptibly, and the changes that happen in Ireland are mainly imperceptible, apart from some journalistic crises and things that are blown sky high. But there's one thing I do remember as being, uh, naturally because I was involved in it, as the invention of television in Ireland. I I spent my youth escaping from Ireland, uh, emigrating often. And uh, in 57, I went to Germany, I remember vividly when I came back into my house in Terenure and my father was glued to the a television set which we hadn't had in our house and there was a television set and there was my father who was mad into classical music and everything and he was watching a thing called Coronation Street. <laughs> I was astonished, I must say. And he said, shh, the characters are terrific in this. So that was a big change and uh, it, it meant that... Uh, television had come to us, but not our own television, but uh, Harlech television. We pirated it in Dublin. Yes. Nobody else in the country had it, I think. Anyway, in 1959, uh, Sean Lamass and J.K. Whitaker made a very, very, very serious decision because they knew they had to get television into the country, our own television into the country. So they made a huge decision that we must have television and they uh, actually advertised for people who would provide it, including, I remember, Pi Radio and Dundrum. And uh, they weren't satisfied with any of these uh, offers. And indeed, because it would have to be a commercial service, and indeed, Leon O'Brien was a great man in Radio Ireland, and he warned them, don't make television a commercial set, but base it on the BBC, Mm. which was the best broadcasting service in the world. I used to listen to it myself in a long way. And they ignored them, and they decided to set it up as a state body, an arm of government, and it would be funded both by a licence fee and by commercials. So we had the worst of all possible worlds. And I think that single uh, decision uh, changed the face of Ireland, because suddenly we were less than citizens. We were customers, clients, consumers... And can I ask you, Bob, about the decision to make it a dual kind of funding service? Was that taken long before the station itself appeared? Oh, two years. 
So that was a fate complete when you arrived. Oh, absolutely. I didn't arrive until New Year's Eve 1961 mm. when the station was launched. I was in Germany. In fact, I came home uh, to collect my books when I got this job teaching in a Berlitz school in Germany. I was a bus conductor in Leeds at the time. Right. And uh, my mother had put had answered an advertisement on my behalf. So I was called for an interview uh, t- for trainees for television. I, I wasn't interested at all. Mm. all. All I wanted to do was go to Germany again. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, I called for this interview one day and three nice people were there. Cyril James, Adrian Folan and another man I can't remember. And it was a lovely interview, and I enjoyed it. And I said, listen, with people like you, I think this television service is going to be great. And then I went off to Germany, enjoying myself, you know, forgot about it. And they wrote to me, I think, a couple of months later, and said, we'd offer you a job as a trainee studio operative. And I wrote back and I said, I'm sorry, I have a contract here. I couldn't leave, possibly leave for a, for a month. And also, I was madly in love with one of my students. And eventually, I decided to come and arrived in November, I think, and uh, straight into it at Marion College in Ballsbridge as a trainee sound operator, you know, which means cable bashing and doing nothing that required any brains, you know. So were you, you were very optimistic at the time about this new service? Well, I thought it was terrific because I, the only job I'd had here really was as a clerical officer in the, Dublin County Council in Parnell Square and I was stuck that for two years after school and uh, the maximum amount I worked every day was 10 minutes. I worked it out 10 minutes. The rest of the time I spent learning lines for plays and practising my singing for musicals that's all I was interested in. But uh, I, I, no, I thought it was terrific. When I got into this place the job atmosphere was not there. It was just pleasure. The whole thing was pleasurable didn't feel like a job at all hmm. and you'd work 10 hour shifts and it was wonderful so it was the first employment I ever had that really I enjoyed very much even though the work I was doing was pretty boring but I was dealing with mixing with people who were performing and acting hmm. and news reading and everything else you know but I stuck it for two years because eventually the job got to me this job that did not have anything to do with what I was interested in you know so uh, sound I wasn't interested Techn- mm. technology I wasn't interested so I went to the, I said uh, oh, no I was just going to give in my resignation and I got a notice from them offering me three jobs three different jobs and one was as a producer of commercial programs sponsored programs on RTE I already had developed an inversion to commercialism you see was this on the radio or the television that was in radio and they offered me another job as a, a new as a trainee uh, news news reader right you know and I did that a bit of training for that and, and but they also offered me a job as a television producer and director so I took the last I should have taken the news reader when I'd be like Gay Byrne now or Mike Murphy you know without the beauty <laughs> Anyway, a television producer. I became a television oh. producer. That was 1964. And I stuck that for a good few years, three or four or five years, you know. And uh, I've moved into film then rather than studio programs. You know, I found studio programs pretty straight-jacketed, you know. So I started making little bits of film. But all the while, you, you, you still had a positive perception of TV itself as a, as a, a development within Irish life. It was the greatest educational institution in Ireland. Mm. It taught people things. What it taught them is questionable, particularly the commercialism, that the consumerism that they taught them. But I thought it was potentially the greatest educational institution that had ever been invented, which it was, until the commercial dimension of it Mm. took over. That's why I left. Now, notwithstanding your own involvement in the station, would you say that the coming of television was the most significant event or one of the most significant events in the last 50, 60 years as far as Irish history is concerned? 80 years as far as I'm concerned. Yes, because it turned people into consumers. So its its effect was negative rather than positive? Well, it depends. You know, if you're American, it's positive. From my perspective, it was was disastrous. You know, turning people into consumers rather than educating them in all kinds of things. You know, there were, of course, small attempts to it. Buntu's kind to, for instance, oh. teach them Irish, feeble attempt to teach people in this country Irish. And there were other, there were some programmes that were very good, but, and my programmes were very good, my films were very good, I know that, because they used to send them all around the world to represent Ireland. Oh. 
And then one day I woke up really and I said, uh, why am I beating my brains out making these films the best I can possibly do and throwing my entire heart? It was my entire life, you know, I had no interest outside this. And I said, all I'm really doing is selling shit to people mm. in between my programmes. And I said, I will not do that anymore. So do you think, again, I'm, I'm looking at this from the outside, do you think that the this um, uh, conflict between, on the one hand, the cultural artistic side of making TV programmes and the commercial imperative, was that conflict evident from the beginning? Do you Incompatible. Think? And do you think it was only inevitable that it would become uh, 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 something that could never be sustained? Well, I, I thought it was mistaken policy and I mm. thought it should be reversed and I used to say that to my colleagues I said listen we should get rid of these commercials they're horrific they debase us and they said yeah but who'd pay for it we need the commercials to pay for our jobs you know so the bo- that was the bottom line for everybody how, how are we going to make a living you know mm. and they knew that it would have to be much smaller if there was no commercial income but people are ambitious you know and they're looking after their own interests their own interests was that the money that came from advertising subsidised their jobs in fact Pat Kenny once said to me on radio after I'd left after I'd written the book actually um, he said you know it's the commercials that pay my salary I said I know that's why it's exorbitant (laughs) anyway I I found it two things incompatible anyway so I left but looking at it from the from the wider yeah, from the wider perspective, the it changed society. Ireland. It yeah. changed Ireland. And it is inevitable what has happened. It changed Ireland insofar as it tried to align itself with every with American culture, basically. Mm. America was the success story, you know, and we had so many contacts with America, you know. And, and we were really a colony of America, even when I was young, because they were the films we watched, American films, Hollywood films, you know. So we were an imaginative colony of America, and so the television became an imaginative colony of America as well, because most of the programs were bought from America anyway. <laughs> most of the dramas, mm. the series and everything came from America anyway. So we were a colony of America. And in fact, when I left uh, television, I drove across America and back across Canada with a Dominican priest who was able to borrow a car and get free lodgings all over America in monasteries. So we drove across to San Francisco, New Mexico, everywhere, Vegas, and then we drove up the West Coast and up to Seattle and then all the way back across Canada. And I was observing America all the time. And I, came, and I met a man in San Francisco in a bar. And I said, how's America doing? And he said, I have seen the future and it doesn't work. <laughs> and I agreed with him mm. totally. And so it has transpired. It has become a, 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 an empire with 800 colonies around the world, armed colonies, and we are one of those colonies now. We are a, an, an aircraft carrier for their war machines. You know, it was inevitable. Introduction of television, good, bad, and different, mm. and it did open people's minds, no doubt about it. It transformed the minds of people in this country. I mean, people, we used to tune into the Flint and I play on Radio Aaron at home when I was a child. Now everybody tuned into Glenrow on television. Mm. But there were, on Addy Wern after the play, there wasn't a commercial for anything. But after Glenrow, there would be a commercial, and before it, and in between. So the real purpose of television here was to sell things to people and to turn them into consumers, which it did, with very dramatic consequences years later, which I'll talk about sometime. I'd, I'd love to hear what you think are the longer-term consequences. But, but staying with the period itself, I mean... Was it inevitable that um, once television was regarded as something that we had to have our own version of, that it would have the effect that it has had? Or could it have been a different model of television that mightn't have had the same kind of pernicious effects? Well, it could have had. And um, in 1978, when they were starting the second channel, RT2, Mm. Conor Crusoe O'Brien suggested that we rebroadcast a BBC channel and I thought at the time, he's mad, that man is mad. But subsequently, I realised that that was one of the only good suggestions the man ever made. I think it would have been terrific if we Network 2 was a retransmitted BBC 2 or BBC 3 or BBC 4 or BBC 1 even. Tailored for this country or just the straightforward? No, just the straightforward. British. Well, it'd have to be tailored fashion slightly mm. for this country, mm. but... It would be the BBC, and we would learn from that. In television, we would learn from that, that there were other values mm. other than uh, commercial values that were at stake. 
you might be able to help me here, but weren't weren't a number of the the, the, the new intake of people into RT or television at the time were were they not some way trained at the BBC and yeah, in various right. yeah. would that have also Pure included the culture or was it just a technical side of things? I well it had to be cultural as well. Mm. I know Murish McNeil uh, was trained in the BBC. Mm. I wasn't trained there, but I used to go there, you know, to talk to people about the programmes I do. And Willis was the only one who did that course who ended up saying, RT being so dependent on commercials is disastrous. Mm, mm. Because I think it was the BBC influence, you know. And But nobody else seemed to agree with that. <laughs> I mean, they might agree with it, but they weren't going to do anything about it, and they certainly can't do anything about it now. They're too deep in the pit. If I extrapolate from what you're saying, it would suggest, therefore, that the BBC, while it had a monopoly in Britain somehow didn't, you know, conjure up this terrible consumer society that we had foisted upon us later through RTE because it wasn't, you know, accepting advertisements. Mm. I mean, can you honestly believe that a model that was funded entirely by by the taxpayer or by a licence wouldn't have eventually succumbed to some kind of consumer-type approach, either through another station appearing like ITV did in the 50s yes, or yes. through TV. Exactly. I mean, everybody did. What was it inevitable is really what I'm saying. I think it, it was not inevitable for a state mm. broadcaster to do yeah, that. Yeah. And I'm not suggesting that state broadcaster, everybody, you know, because of the communist thing, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the 50s, which was very rampant, you know, we were terrified of communism. And anything to do with state socialism or anything was anathema. Uh, I, because it was anathema, I had endorsed it. I inquired into it yeah. and found it made sense. And uh, but the, people were afraid of the state, you know, mm. and not realizing that the state kept most of us alive mm. and employed a quarter of a million civil servants and gave them steady, pensionable jobs. And uh, I think the state is a very important thing. It has to be because mm. it's our state. Yeah. Unfortunately, of course. It, private interests take over the mm. movers and shakers in politics and they're all funded by private money, corporate funds, you mm. know, except a few independents, of course. Anyway, to move on from that, I mean, that's an old tune that I've played too long. Um, but television itself, I mean, the actual medium, I remember, and I've, I've watched this several times, watching De Valera's introductory remarks when the I station remember. opened. Yeah. And his remarks were basically on the lines of, well, look, this is something we have to accept, but I don't think it's going to be a good thing because it's like nuclear energy or nuclear warfare. It could be very destructive. And I don't think he was talking about the commercial aspect of television. I think he was talking about television itself as a medium. I, I don't into know. the outside world. He did it. have reservations about it. I know that. And I don't know whether it was reservations about the commercialisation of television, yeah. but he did recognise the educational possibilities. He recognised other few things as well. I mean, I... I I never was a De Valera man, although my father was, actually. Mm. And he used to say De Valera is the greatest parliamentarian in Western Europe. He was a Fianna Fáil man, of course, you know. And, uh, but, but De Valera advocated in, in this much-mocked speech mm. young people uh, entertaining themselves at the crossroads. Mm. Oh, the 1940 yeah. speech, I think, yeah. yeah. And, and he also advocated small industries oh, yeah, yeah. At, for yeah. every village. Yes. I mean, that... And that came from Germany, by the way. That's why Germany is so prosperous, mm, because mm. every village has its own special... They might be making safety pins in one village, washers in another village, yeah. little bits of equipment. Each village tends to have its own industry, and it lives there, and the people run the industry, and that's what we should have adopted. We should, there's always, we should have done this. I'll tell you another thing we could have done. I met Mickey Joe Costello in, when I was in television, uh, I was doing some programme and I had him on a panel and afterwards we met and talked and uh, oh yes I had I did a documentary on a co-op in Skibbereen and uh, I was influenced by Schumacher's Small is Beautiful mm. philosophy mm. and there were these people running this vegetable co-op and I thought that's very good and I spoke to Mikey, Mickey Joe Costello about it maybe before maybe after I don't know but he said that was what I thought he said, that's why I started Air and Foods. So that uh, each, this land in the Gaeltacht then south and west, extreme west, not suitable for ranchers, because ranchers around the country mm. and still do. 
He said if people grew vegetables, and he was absolutely right because the Dutch came over and made North Dublin a paradise yeah, of yeah. vegetable growing, yeah. and we still buy their vegetables Indeed. when we're not getting them from Spain and Chile. Yes, but that was his policy. Mm. Unfortunately, Tony O'Reilly took over Aaron Foods. He had been he was a brilliant man, uh, Tony O'Reilly, and he had run Board Banya. He was only mm. thirty three, same mm. age as he. In fact, was exactly the same age as myself. And then they made him, gave him Aaron Foods when Mickey Joe retired. Almost immediately, he sold it to Heinz. Yeah. <laughs> in Pittsburgh <laughs> and subsequently became of course the chief bottle washer of Heinz Food that was the price for his being made a vice president of Heinz I thought well he's a businessman that's all he is Tony and as he always said Ireland is a good place to tug out in but the real game is elsewhere and Tony had that philosophy all his life he may have been right a lot of people have imitated him and everybody imitates him now they said the real business is elsewhere. Mm. We can't be self-sufficient in any respect. That's why we bring in Google and Facebook and everything else. But I thought that was a betrayal. And I live in Connemara and nobody, very few people grow vegetables. The only hopeful thing I've seen in Connemara since I came here 47 years ago, 50 years ago, mm. is a young man, a son of a great poet and playwright I knew, Johnny Cole Wake, And he turned his father's acres. He had a few acres on the main road. And he's surviving beautifully down there. Mm-hmm. And he's growing the most beautiful vegetables and he supplies the local shops. If that had been done all over the West and the South, mm. these would be the prosperous places, I yes, can tell you. Yeah. But these are, might have been, should have been. And they all depend on business decisions which mm. are pragmatic and ruthless. So if I, if I try and distill everything we're saying about TV and TV in the 60s and TV in Ireland... There are two elements to it. There's television itself as a medium, which um, may have good effects, may have bad effects. Um, it's like any other medium. But then there's the commercialization of, of television and RTE, which is, um, in your perspective, a bad thing because it led people into a kind of a consumerist mentality and that paved the way for a lot of other things that subsequently happened. Mm-hmm. But in general, if I was to ask you to pinpoint the most positive development you can think of in your lifetime that happened in Ireland, would it have anything to do with television at all or are you thinking of something Well, that's different? the only thing I was, uh, knew anything about, really, you know. Mm. Um, but it sounds like it's a double-edged sword. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 look, I think it's great that television was in, mm. our own television service was very important, you know. Some great work done there, but the whole thing is framed in this commercial straitjacket. Yes. That's my only point. But it had spin-offs, for instance, that opened the world to us, especially the American world. And one of the things that came from America in the 60s was the ideology of feminism. And when I heard about this, and I used to know Nell McCafferty and Ruth Riddick and Dula Fennell and people like that, and I thought, this is a revolution that is worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. This could change the whole system if women mm. were in charge. Yeah. I thought I was very optimistic because I thought women were great and I still do but gradually uh, are we talking about the 70s now or was it well 60s 70s yeah, yeah. yeah well it came in in the 60s you know the second wave I think it's called is that what it's called yeah late 60s. anyway I thought this is a revolution but what happened in the revolution happened in every revolution mm. the apparatchiks take over mm. professionals take over the middle class took over and I met Ruth Riddick once wonderful woman in uh, our local pub and she was talking about this wonderful feminism. I said, yeah, and I mentioned what I thought about the revolution, it's great. And I said, the problem is, of course, that uh, you are middle class and your cohorts are middle class, but the lower classes will still be cleaning your floors. And so it happened. They broke the glass ceiling, Mm. ensured that they'd square-shouldered executive jobs, but the ordinary people would go and fuck themselves. (laughs) And that's what happened, you know. Yeah. And uh, the revolution, all revolutions end like that, really. It's very sad. In compromise would, of some sort. In compromise. Or they they see the system and they confront the system and they know it can't change. It's innate in us. It's just mm. terrible. And it sounds, all we like, can it sounds do like you're talking about original sin, the, <laughs> imperfe- the imperfectibility of, of man well, and woman. I think it's a little less... Uh, Glorious than that. Right. It's, uh, it's, it's people who are educated see the way the system goes, mm. see the system. 
And having spent a lot of money on their education, they say, well, I'm not going to take a job as a street sweeper. Yeah. I'll have to get a job in, in relation to the money that has been spent on my education, third level education, of course. And I have to pay all of that back, you know, and oh. reward my parents because yes. my parents have sacrificed to make me. And uh, so they, they go for the, the job and they ignore the context in which they are operating. Oh, in oh. fact, the, the total lack of uh, a sociology in our educated classes always astonishes me, you know. I know of only one academic who, who touches on this. That's Kieran Allen of UCD, a magnificent uh, social scientist. And he details this whole business, you know. Well, Raymond Williams detailed it as well. Mm-hmm. Richard Hoggart detailed it in, in, in these sociology, sociological people from England. I read them all, you know. And there is no cure for it. Mm. There's no cure for it. Because you might be right. Maybe it's original sin. <laughs> maybe we're imperfect. Well, we won't get too deep into that, maybe. <laughs> no. But um, if I can take us away from the uh, the potential um, positive effect of television onto something that you believe is definitely a negative and the most significant negative. Yeah, well, uh, the other thing I'm interested in, I'm very interested in religion. Mm. I think human beings are religious people. Should I say not religious, but spiritual? We are spiritual creatures. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we're way behind the time because uh, empirical scientists in the 19th century showed that there is no such thing as anything other than matter, materialism. They proved that, you know. Mm. And we didn't believe it because we didn't know about it. And we just caught up with it in the last 50 years that, yeah, materialism is important, you know. You have to make a living. And so we abandoned the result of that was uh, destroying the Catholic Church, mm. which self-destructed. I mean, I left. I was, <laughs> here's the irony. I was religious uh, programs producer in RTE for 18 months, two years. And it was there I made most of my films. And my general point was we are all handicapped. Some obviously, some less obviously, others imperceptibly but we are all handicapped in the sense that none of us is perfect, right? Therefore, pay attention to the obviously handicapped because we're talking about ourselves. But it was there that I started studying religion. Mm. I mean, I abandoned religion because I learned so much about it when I was a religious programs producer. I learned what it was about, something I knew nothing about. We weren't taught religion. Were you talking about programs like RARC? I remember RARC from RARC. the 60s. Wonderful, yeah. No, yeah. I'm talking about the programs I made. I learned from those. Okay. But the RARC people had the idea as well. And they operated under the Vatican II. Mm. They knew the scene. Joe Dunn, great man. Yes, I remember him. And Jim Stack. They were terrific people and they made terrific series quietly, beautifully, you know. And we all praised them and said, wonderful. But there was no philosophy in it. No philosophy in it. It was just showing something, you know. Mm. And that objectivity was something that was uh, supposed to be the ideal. But I didn't, I abandoned religion then. I abandoned religion, didn't have my children baptised, turned my back on it completely until the Catholic Church was destroyed in the last 20 years. And we learned all about this abuse. And I said, well, they had it coming to them, you know, because the hierarchy protecting itself. An organisation is a living thing and the object is to protect the organisation not to protect the people in it. It's like RTE. RTE is, an or- is, a, is a living organism mm. constituting cells called human beings who run it. Mm. And some of these cells are good, are, they're bacteria. Some of the bacteria are good, some of the bacteria are bad. And it's a constant struggle, but the bad bacteria win because of the influence of advertisers. Sorry if this is too abstruse. But a Jesuit said a thing to me once, uh, oh, about 10 years ago. He said, of course, you know that the church had to go because it was the glue, however imperfect, that held society together. Now, are you saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, or do you regret the fact that the church foundered when it did? Well, I think it was inevitable, you know. It was inevitable. It was a corrupt establishment. Mm. It was inevitable. And the I think, only thing I have against it is it concealed the truth of the message, love thy neighbour, mm. which was the only message worth telling. And it concealed that. It said that there are just wars. There can be just wars. You can kill people in the name of justice, you know. We are the good guys, so we can kill people who are bad guys. And um, anyway, it was that kind of thinking that led me to... to, to uh, but when I saw the glue, when I saw the society falling apart, mm, which mm. it has done, it has yes. fallen apart, 
I said, that's the one thing that that stupid old church did. It was a glue that gave people a sense of ethics. That was the only ethical part of our lives, that church, unless mm. we were Protestants who had this personal ethics, you know, mm. and weren't much better than ourselves, mm. you know. But uh, that glue was dissolved in the consumer society, and it was every man for himself emphasised that philosophy, every man for himself, and to hell with the Burgudgers, and the devil take the hindmost. It was shocking that that thin ethical glue was dissolved, faded away. And I blame the Catholic Church for that, not for its abuse of children or covering up abuse. Mm. I blame them for being so transparent that they, not transparent, but so superficial and so so dyed in the wool in its liturgies and its rituals and its uh, occasional, well, its, it's uh, what do you call it, hierarchical mm. system, you know, not letting people think for themselves, afraid to let people think for themselves. I blame them for that. And so I'd have nothing to do with it, but I still regret that it's gone because mm. it gave comfort to a lot of people. And this is not touching on the question of the existence of a, of a, of a higher intelligence. Right? Yes. It's nothing to do with that. I'm thinking practically about the effects of its demise, which is just as bad as its existence. That's it for part one. My conversation with Bob Quinn continues in part two.